Welcome to the first episode of Tidal Page. We're so pleased that you've joined us for this first program, and we hope that you'll share our enthusiasm for conversations about good books, conversations that have all the advantages and opportunities that the internet provides. Today, we'll be talking to four prominent novelists whose books all have both local and global aspects. We'll go from the Lower East Side of Manhattan to Shanghai to a small Midwestern university to Las Vegas. One of the best ways to see and understand the world is first-class fiction. The title page for this program reads, All Over the Map. Richard Price has written eight critically acclaimed novels, most of them about urban life in an unmistakably honest and gritty way. He has also written numerous screenplays, of which the best known is perhaps The Color of Money, for which he was nominated for an Academy Award. He also writes for the hit HBO series The Wire, and he's here to talk about his new novel, Lush Life. Colin Harrison is the author of six critically acclaimed novels, four of which have been selected by the New York Times Book Review as notable books of the year. All are atmospheric novels of suspense and violence that also explore the underside of city life. He's here to talk about his new book, The Finder. Susan Choi has won the Asian American Literary Prize for her first novel, The Foreign Student. Her second novel, American Woman, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. She's here to talk to us about her third book, a person of interest. Charles Bach's first novel, Beautiful Children, is a New York Times bestseller. He was born and raised in Las Vegas, which serves as the setting for this novel, and he's taught fiction at the Gotham Writers' Workshop in New York City. His short stories have appeared in Esquire. Welcome to you all. Richard, in a nutshell, the story of lush life. Um, it's about the Lower East Side uh, in transition uh, between it's sort of beat up Dinkins era existence and the incursion of Giuliani time and real estate to make it one of the safest areas in the city, um, oblivious to the fact that other than the new bohemers that are living down there, there's also about five worlds that have been there forever. And it's basically about when worlds collide. And what happens when they collide? Um, a shot goes off, um, there are headlines for five days, and then everybody goes back to their respective worlds on day six. And the victim is? Well, the, the victim is, um, you know, your basic MFA that lives down there, um, who perceives of the Lower East Side as this uh, playground. Um, they can sort of feel like they're in rent. Um, <laughs> but they're occupying the same physical space with the Fujianese Chinese with uh, housing project people that have been there forever, with Hispanic and Dominican people that have, uh, still live in the unrehabbed, untouched uh, tenements. Um, and all these worlds um, occupy the same physical space, but they don't ever see each other. It's not that they're even hostile. They just, um, it's like they're invisible except at about 3, 4 in the morning when a couple of kids from the projects decide to go into the interior, like Ludlow Street or somewhere like that, and flash a gun in front of uh, a couple of La Boemers that are bar hopping and get money for uh, Chinese takeout. And the kid who's got a gun in his face has never had a gun in his face before because he's from Indiana. And he thinks he's in a movie, and he says an inappropriate movie line, and the kid with the gun has never seen anybody from Indiana before and winds up pulling the trigger. If I said to you, it's a, it's a wonderful scene, a uh, scary scene, if I said to you that the first 150 pages of this book are in some ways about a mistake, would you know what I meant or could you explain it? Hmm, okay. Um, Maddie's mistake. Well, the, the in a nutshell, uh, what happens is that there's a witness, there's somebody with the kid that got shot. And he responds uh, in total fear and then is ashamed of his reaction. He never calls 911. He sort of runs away. Um, and when the police get there, uh, he starts lying out of shame. And when the police hear a lie, 
they're thinking he's covering something. Uh, and in fact, he is innocent. He's just a human being. The police go whole hog trying to break him. He's one of these people that came down to the Lower East Side at the age of 21 and 22 when you're going to live forever and we're all going to be great artists and we're all going to be maverick entrepreneurs. And it's okay if we're bartenders now and it's okay if we're maitre d's now because it's all hyphenated. I'm really a bartender uh, slash performance artist and I'm a maitre d slash playwright. Uh, but all of a sudden you're 34 and 35 and the hyphen drops off and you're just a bartender. But everybody around you is still 22 and 23 and they still have stars in their eyes and you feel like you're losing your mind. And this is a kid who's sort of hanging on by his fingernails and what doesn't break in him uh, from the murder uh, is completely demolished by the cops over the next eight hours. The, the um, projects that you talk about, they coexist with <clears throat> this new bohemian life, um, and the collision is very, is very notable. Um, what about those lives and the projects? How do you know about them? Well, I grew up in a housing project in the Bronx, but that was a different time and a different place. I mean, we're talking the 50s and the 60s, and at that point, projects were doing what they were supposed to do, which were... Uh, they were launching pads for the next generation. You know, work, they were for working class people. Um, divorce was pretty unheard of. Drugs. This is, this is pre pre Vietnam, pre sort of pre Beatles almost. And you know everybody went on. You know my generation. And I guess once you hit the seventy late sixties on between Reagan Reaganomics. Um, the, the incursion of drugs, uh, the drying up of everything, all the other options, they've gone from launching pads to uh, holding cells where you have generations stacked up in the same apartment for the first time ever. The, the, the impact on Matty Clark, the uh, cop of uh, the press and his bosses, was of great interest to me. Um, in your recent, sh one of the shows you've written for The Wire, you show the effect of the press on these matters. Can you talk a little bit about how it works in Lush Life? Well, well, in terms of anything, say, in politics and, and, and homicide investigation is politics. It's media is the tail that wags the dog. What police respond to is the stuff that makes the papers. Um, and because what happens is when, when the police look bad in the papers, they can't solve anything or, 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 or they screw the pooch in some way, <laughs> it reflects on the mayor. The mayor will call up his police commissioner and say, what are you doing to me? The police commissioner will call down to, to the precinct commander saying, what the hell are you doing to me? The precinct commander will go to the lieutenant and saying, what are you guys doing to me? You know, it's, uh, I don't know what kind of language I can use here, but something rolls downhill. Um, you can use the and, whole language okay. if you want. <laughs> so, and the, the irony is, it's the, if there's a situation it, where it, it's a bad homicide and, and, some, and they blow it, the, the reaction will be, well, how do we handle the press? You know, and oftentimes it'll be, well, let it die. You know, press gag. And, you know, maybe two, three days from now, we'll solve some triple header in Washington Heights and everybody will jump all over that and we'll be happy to talk. But, you know, for right now, we'll just, we're not talking to them, and we'll just watch it recede in the papers. Um, so, so like This doesn't look like this horse has left the barn. There's no way we're going to solve this, or, you know, and so we've got to cut our losses. So like everything else, then, especially in Lush Life, it turns out that this investigation is very much, or at least to some extent, a creature of media coverage. Well, it's about job protection. I mean, people, you know, the higher up you go, the, the more your job is not about the job that you were supposed to do. In this case, uh, you know, fighting crime in some way. I mean, your job is about helping your boss look good. And your underling's job is helping you look good. And it all boils down to this body in the street. So when you have a homicide detective who's squatting over a body, you have to imagine on his shoulders is his boss, 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 his boss. All, all the way to City Hall, and, you know, it's kind of hard to concentrate. Speaking of the body lying in the street, there's one passage I, I want to read. When Tristan, who is the kid from the projects who does the shooting, uh, he's remembering what happened, and he says, um, 
Uh, Tristan stood rooted in the pea gravel of the roof, his tongue dry as leather in his mouth. Uh, he's remembering the small kick in his grip when he squeezed one off, the guy looking up on impact, the whites of his eyes all visible beneath. Then again and again, that unexpected jolt in his hand, like the snap of a dog as the 22 bucked. It sounds like he didn't mean to shoot him. Uh, no, he, he didn't. Um, it, was just, it was a fight or flight reaction. Um, he had the gun. Uh, he was expecting a certain reaction. And because it's somebody who thinks he's in a movie and reciting a John Wayne line, <laughs> the kid didn't know what else to do, so he squeezed one off. Um, and a lot, with a lot of these kids, you, you know, you're dealing with people that are very self-centered, but they have no center. And everything is, you know, is, is a gut reaction. Just like like there, there's something going down, you respond to it. You don't think three seconds beyond that response. And after you do it, you're looking at it, you, your eyes get big for a couple of minutes. You go home and you either freak out or you don't. Colin, your book also is about a crime in New York City. Can you put it into a nutshell for us? Uh, well, <clears throat> at the center of the book is uh, a Chinese woman named Jin Li who has come to New York City uh, to uh, work in a company that uh, cleans the trash out of corporate offices every day in Manhattan. And she is not exactly what she appears to be. And she uh, is very smart and uh, nonetheless gets into trouble. And her, uh, her boyfriend, uh, who has come back to the United States after some time away to be with his dying father, ends up being the person who must find her. He's, he's the finder. He's the finder. Right. It, the, the book starts with a gruesome and obscene murder. Who gets killed? Uh, two unnamed uh, illegal Mexican immigrants, two young women who are uh, working in the city, working, cleaning these offices. And uh, one of the reasons I chose them uh, is I'm very aware of the, uh, the, the Mexicans, illegal, un illegal, undocumented, whatever, who are in the city making the city run uh, every day. And, um, I, I'm fascinated by their presence in the city, and I, so I opened the book with, with them. Right. There are Chinese immigrants in, um, in Richard's novel, and we have Mexican illegals here. What's the means of the murder? I'm going to make you say it. I, <laughs> I'm going to make you say it. Uh, they are killed with a, uh, a load of uh, septic waste that is dumped into their car, uh, out on a remote uh, parking lot uh, next to the beach uh, in the farthest reaches of Brooklyn. And the target was Jen Lee. The target was Jen Lee. She's in the car, but just out of chance, she's left the car to uh, uh, relieve herself in the weeds and the tall grasses next to the parking lot. And that's when the two guys arrive with their two trucks and they don't kill her and thereby hangs the tail. Then the search is on the after that, on. in both directions. So we have the scatological um, groundwork laid right there at the beginning. Uh, but also, Jin Lee works uh, in paper disposal for a financial company. Um, and I wondered if you uh, meant these two waste disposals to be joined in the reader's mind. You know, I didn't consciously... Uh attempt to align them. You could certainly put them in juxtaposition to each other and say that there's maybe some kind of meditation going on about the, you know, the product and waste of the city. Um, frankly, just wiring the plot and getting it to work uh, was uh, enough trouble as it was, and so I didn't work out the metaphysics right. of the you-know-what. I, I think the metaphysics are definitely there. I was <laughs> very intrigued by putting those two things together. Wall Street's kind of a character in this book. Um, how, did you do a lot of research on this subject? Um, well, I would say that um, not so much Wall Street as money, uh, corporate New York City money, and the way that money flows globally. There is some manipulation of a stock price in the book. Um, and 
did I do some research? I do the kind of research that uh, a New Yorker who uh, talks to his friends and reads the newspaper and uh, sort of keeps an ear out does. Uh, you know, if you go to certain restaurants and just listen to the people talk, you can hear a lot. Especially expensive restaurants. That's true. <laughs> That's when you hear the money talk. <laughs> um, you know, you also, there's a, there's a passage in, um, in the book that fascinated me. A woman who's a doctor is uh, diagnosing one of those financial high rollers. I think his name is Martz. Right. Based on my clinical experience and a brief interaction, the man you're in trouble with cannot be depended upon to be highly rational or kind and decent. I don't care how much money he has. He's an animal under stress. He's got high cortisol levels, increased blood pressure, who knows what. He's also clearly an aggressor given how much wealth he's accumulated. She's a doctor and one of the things that interests me about doctors is that they know things about us that we don't know and they don't tell us either. And she has had this brief um, interaction with, this, with Martz, a very powerful uh, billionaire uh, investor who is one of the forces of uh, monetized violence in the book, to coin a phrase. And uh, she's had this interaction and she's gotten the kind of wet read that doctors get on people. And she sees that he's sick, he's aggressive, he's rich, he's mad and he's dangerous, and he's also after her husband. So she's providing intelligence about him. The, the fact is that Jin Lee is involved in a scam. She's part of it, she knows she's part of it, and yet she's sort of the heroine of the book. How did that figure in your sort of moral universe? Well, that's a good question. She is culpable, she's not uh, Susie Cream Cheese, she's not an innocent, and her actions do lead uh, at least uh, uh, indirectly to the death of the two young Mexican, Mexican girls. She's also though, um, I, won't, I don't know if the word victim is the right word, but susceptible to larger forces taking place. And uh, she's also uh, clever and intrepid and physically attractive and I'm kind of hoping that the reader will you know, feel that she's okay. Well, I think that's true that by the end she seems to have learned her lesson and she's with this utter hero, Maddie, so right. we, can, we can hope the best. You just said something fascinating and I think it applies to everybody here and I think it applies to all good modern novels. You said large forces bearing down on her. It's clear in Richard's book and in The Finder that there are huge, almost global forces at work on individual lives. Did you have that in mind when you were writing? Absolutely, and uh, one of the things that interests me a lot is the way that uh, China is imposing itself on the United States and vice versa. And in the case of New York City, uh, China is in a lot of conversations and it's in a lot of boardrooms, it's in bedrooms, it's on the street. And uh, I thought it was a fascinating notion to take uh, a, a woman who was Chinese Chinese, born and raised in China, educated in China, bring her here and kind of let her loose and uh, really make the two things just c clash. How, all of you, how, how aware were you when you were writing of um, that same kind of process of large uh, forces working on small people? Well, when, I, when when I was writing this, the whole the whole uh, thrust of the book was how hard it is just to do your damn job. If you could work, if people let you, but everybody's agenda it is so different than 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 yours at ground level. That um, I mean, you you can live if they let you. You can work if they let you. But otherwise, you're squeezed, or you're yes. always squeezed. You always squeeze, but you know. And there are Chinese immigrants in your book, as I recall. Are there not? So. Chinese food, Chinese immigrants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's the same. Susan, were you sort of international? Well, you're obviously, in your book, uh, there's a similar dynamic. Yeah, well, I mean, I could borrow some words from Richard and say, you know, I mean, when I was writing my book, I, I was constantly aware of how hard it is for my character just to be just to be like a normal human being in the eyes of his community because he, under scrutiny, becomes increasingly suspicious and suspect just, just by sort of having reactions that I consider mm -hmm. normal and human under, the circumst under his circumstances, which we'll discuss. Right. 
Charles, your book is a, set in Las Vegas, which seems yeah. to be a sort of representative, in it, some ways, of everywhere. It's, well, it's interesting. Um, one thing I did was I, I made a conscious decision to recycle as much as I possibly could in terms of character names, um, things. Uh, ice cream truck is used for something that is not delivering ice cream. Um, there's a character named Lestat. There's a character named Pony Boy. There's a character, Danger Prone Daphne. Um, to reflect the idea that Vegas itself takes the Eiffel Tower and turns it into, into a casino, that there's a, a certain amount of that that happens. And I wanted a landscape that is suffused in pop culture and, and where everyone is very, very involved with it without it becoming a list of brand names, without becoming a, uh, without it becoming a, uh, just a, a list, but rather a world where it's our currency and it's a canon and it has an effect on, my book is very much about uh, the people on the wrong side of the street, the people that you cross the street to avoid. And I wanted all kinds of influences that can cause someone to turn one way instead of another way. And, um, and one of those influences is the extreme amount of money in Las Vegas and the sort of distorted culture. I think distorted culture, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And money does make it possible. There's, you know, there's a middle class, uh, upper middle class family that's doing that's doing pretty well, and, and their their son doesn't come home on a on a Saturday night. You know, let me come let me come back to that. Yeah. Let me talk to Susan and sure, because sure, sure. because she mentioned I want to yeah. since since Colin has Chinese immigrants and Richard has uh, Chinese immigrants, Susan has an Asian immigrant, unspecified unspecified nation of yeah. origin. Yeah, I um I had a it's funny because my first two books are are also also involve Asian immigrant characters and I was very specific in those books about where they came from and, and sort of who they were and for some reason with this book I really I had this instinct that I didn't want to specify his nationality. Professor Lee is the title character of your novel, um, A Person of Interest. What happens to him? Professor Lee's an aging math professor at a second-rate Midwestern school. He's a guy that hasn't really um, he hasn't really lived the life he meant to. He has a couple failed marriages, one grown child who won't speak to him. He's not really a star in his field in any way. He doesn't really have any friends. And when the book opens, he um, finds himself sort of, you know, metaphorically at the outer edge of the impact crater of an explosion. Um, his colleague in the neighboring <coughs> office... Literal explosion. Well, yeah, metaphorically he's at the edge of a crater, but literally there's an explosion. His colleague on the other side of the wall opens a package and a letter bomb goes off. And it knocks Lee in his office out of his chair. And as he's lying on the floor, he has a moment of thinking, oh good, about this catastrophe because his colleague is young, popular, everything that Lee isn't. So he has instant um, schadenfreude, even though he's in shock. Yeah, about which he then experiences instant and deep shame. and. Um, and, you know, this explosion actually unearths all of these things in Dr. Lee's life that he's ashamed of and feels guilty about, um, all these emotional crimes that he's guilty of. But the result is that he behaves oddly. He doesn't, he doesn't act right. He, he has a hard time being normal. He's suddenly under all this scrutiny, having, you know, having been the, the near victim of this catastrophe that becomes, an, you know, a subject of the national news media. And his reactions are off. How closely did you mean it to mirror or reflect academic bombings like Kaczynski and um, Wenho Lee, if I have it right. Yeah. Were well, you, you know, aware of those? Oh, yeah I, was, yeah. I was really aware of, I mean, this book started out with, with my interest in Kaczynski and sort of ended up getting infected by my interest in Wenho Lee, who didn't have anything to do with a bombing. But um, initially, I wanted to write a book that, that sort of, that drew on the Unabomber case, and that was, that was where it began. Um, but when I realized that my character was going to, you know, fall afoul of the authorities because they start to suspect him of the bombing. Why, why do they suspect him? You know, there are a couple of different reasons that are sort of elaborate, but um, the large-scale reason is that he's a really, he's a really unsuccessfully genial person. All of his, e even the efforts that he makes to be personable um, are disastrous, and he really doesn't make the effort. 
you know, and so his personality becomes this becomes circumstantial evidence against him. Did you have in mind taking somebody who was basically withdrawn, uh, perhaps a little paranoid and envious, and making him a person of interest to the reader that is sympathetic? Yeah, I did. I mean, I mean, the title, it's the first time I've ever had a title from the beginning of writing a book. Usually I finish the book and then panic for six months. But I wanted him to be a person of interest to the reader as well as a person of interest to law enforcement. And speaking of immigrants, as we have been a little bit, what, what aspect does the immigrant status of Professor Lee, as he remembers his marriages, his daughter who evidently is speaking to him, uh, his departmental uh, relationships, how conscious did you want the reader to be of the immigration aspect of it? Well, I wanted the reader to always know that he's a foreign-born American, and that's how he thinks of himself, but he thinks of himself as an American primarily. That's why I didn't want him to be, you know, Malaysian American Professor Lee or Korean American Professor Lee. I, I, I didn't want this to be a book in which the focus keeps being tossed backward to his origin because, you know, then you get into this idea of ethnicity and essence and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the way Lee perceives of himself. It's not the most important chapter in his life. He's an American and, you know, the irony of his situation is that he's viewed by everyone with suspicion because he's a foreign other, basically. So that's what, that's what I wanted to draw So he's on. both. It's a cake and eat it. And successful. That is, he's sort of Ur-American in some ways, and he's also um, has that immigrant Yeah, for him, he's a quintessential American, you know, but none of, none of, his, none of the people in the book view him that way. Right. Um, Jim Morrison is in this book, isn't he? In a, in a sense. Yeah, Jim <laughs> Morrison is a... Lee, it takes a while for Professor Lee to realize that he's, um, that he's actually under, under a magnifying glass. He sort of, he, he, he staggers around for a while uh, w with no awareness of the fact that he's being investigated. Jim Morrison's an FBI agent that he meets when he goes to pick up his mail at the university mail room one day. And, and uh, the young, skinny, pimpled student who has a work-study job also working in the mail room hears Jim Morrison introduce himself to Professor Lee and goes, no way, and, but Lee doesn't get the joke. He's very disconnected from pop culture. I was so way. sure that mailroom clerk was the bomber, I can't tell you. I was so, I thought I had it figured out. But wow, I, but Dan, I, I never even thought of that. No, he seems very suspicious. Um, um, why is it chronologically so complicated? Or say complex, use the good word. Yeah, not complicated. Not complicated. Not at all hard to no, follow. No, it's not hard to follow. Yet rich and intricate. How come it isn't linear? You know, um, when I talk about how this bomb sort of metaphorically unearths all this stuff in Dr. Lee's past that, um, that has been festering for a long time, he's guilty of these crimes, not this particular crime that he's being investigated for, but of emotional crimes against the only woman he ever loved, against his child. And these circumstances that he finds himself under, start they start returning him to the past. And the past turns out to be relevant for more reasons than one. I mean, it's not just that he enters into this period of sort of intense and kind of tortured reflection, but the bomber is actually someone out of his past. And so it loops back, comes up, loops back again, comes up until we have a full portrait. Yeah, yeah, the flashbacks aren't just flashbacks because actually, um, actually sort of the prime mover of the whole plot is someone out of that frame of the story. Right. Um, there's a wonderful passage here that, that struck me um, because I felt it was um, so typical of the way people respond to crises. Um, after the bombing happens and uh, the professor is dead, um, the students are gathered in um, a group, uh, in groups around the campus, and you say, or Lee thinks, I should say, the college-wide assembly, the batteries of grief counselors, the suspension of classes all begin to strike Lee now that he was free of the chastising presence of Sandra, as sanctimonious and self-important, as if the single death of a popular professor of dubious talent, however inexplicable and unjust it was, was on the same level as the death of John F. Kennedy. Now, the reason I like that passage, besides the fact that it's a wonderful sentence, is that it gets at the heart of something that happens when we have public disasters these days, all the way from Princess Diana's death to this bombing. Do you share Lee's uh, uh, misanthropic sense that there's some self-indulgence involved? 
I do. I mean, I share his sense that there's a certain amount of just, yeah, overweening self-importance on, on the part of the mourners, in a way. I mean, the thing that he finds distasteful also is that students who didn't even know this dead professor are sort of thrilled by their peripheral role in a drama. You know, they're, they're all standing and weeping together because it's a big thing that's happened to them, and there's something narcissistic about it that turns them off. That, that's, I think one of the things that you do so well with Professor Lee is you show how out of it he is and sort of on the margins on the one hand. On the other hand, a lot of his perceptions are very accurate, partly because he's removed. Um, Charles, yeah. a nutshell. Into again. the margins. Uh, <laughs> speaking of margins, uh, yeah. yeah, speaking of the margins, you're yeah, way out there Welcome the to margins. the freak world. Um, Twelve-year-old boy, Newell Ewing, is uh, born and raised in Las Vegas. He goes out on a Saturday night with an older friend, Kenny, and uh, doesn't come home. Uh, one thread, kind of the spine of the book, follows the next year in his parents' lives while they search for their kid, find, try and find out what happened, and keep their marriage together. Um, another thread obviously follows Newell and Kenny out on the town on this fateful Saturday night. Everyone they meet gets a, uh, gets a little story and has some involvement with things and kind of expands and has a role. And uh, as we start to move further towards margins, uh, it moves into the world of teen runaways. It moves into the adult side of Las Vegas with strip clubs and adult films and uh, adult film tryout scenes. And uh, hopefully there's also um, a very human, uh, very hopeful, uh, best part of ourselves in the book and some jokes that don't suck. Uh, so that would be my nutshell. A lot of jokes that don't suck. Let's the hope. disappearance of Newell yeah. um, takes place because, as I recall, his mother, Lorraine, makes a decision to allow him to go out. She does not want him to go out. She, her husband, Lincoln, and her reach an agreement, he reach an agreement to, a, to let the boy go. Uh, if it's up to her, she probably wouldn't do it. He wants a night of the two of them out alone. Does that sound so bad? Uh, which is certainly, you know, any parent has been there. And, um, and, you know, what could happen? And then, of course, I wrote the book, so what happens is uh, the kid goes missing. Yeah. He goes missing. Yeah. You, 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 and as he goes missing, you bring these other characters in who have either direct or, or, or oblique relationships right. to his plot. Right. Uh, one of the things they have in common is a great deal about art and beautiful children. In different kinds of art. There's no Vermeer paintings in, uh, I don't even know if Vermeer's a painter, I think he is, uh, in beautiful is. children. <laughs> there is uh, the art in the world that I really know and kind of was weaned on and, and was raised on, which is a world suffused in pop culture, um, and which I, I uh, and and that is you know Vegas is it is the epicenter of of pop not in that it creates it but that it is a creation of you know if there's a great late 20th century early 21st century city it is Las Vegas and uh, because it just absorbs and absorbs and and hollows and and creates shiny wonderful things it seemed for me for the uh, the, the characters for the world that I understand. That's the canon. That's the currency and the quest. And so that's what people are going to understand and know. No one in Las, you know, there's, there's a Guggenheim in Las Vegas, um, but it, it's, it's a status marker. I don't think there's a whole lot of people visiting the Guggenheim who go to Vegas to check out the Guggenheim. And you don't need the Guggenheim sands. Right, right. <laughs> you mean the Guggenheim Museum? Yeah, there is a Guggenheim Museum, and it's in a casino, you know? And it's in a casino, and, it, and it's, it's there as a marker so that the casino can say, look how cultured we are, you know? And what their first exhibit was motorcycles, you know, was the motorcycle show. Perfect. So, so right, because that makes sense, right. you know, that makes sense. The, the, the art that you're talking about in this book is often a comic book art, yeah. uh, pornographic films, if, yeah. if that's art. Uh, and so once on. in a while it can be, yeah. And uh, um, heavy metal, rock music, rap, um, any, you know, uh, chat rooms, uh, uh, punk rock flyers, there's a punk, punk art in the book. Yeah, I, it seemed important to me. One idea that I had at some point was the people who see Pulp Fiction, the people who see Sin City, the people who 
traffic in, um, and go the first day and, and get online and have huge debates about this stuff. Let's put the micro, put, you know, let's hold the camera to them and who maybe don't to pay attention to serious fiction, but are plugged in in all kinds of other ways. This is, this is good stuff. It's this like, is good stuff. This is a potential, this is part, this is part of the whole. And it's certainly a part of Las Vegas where everyone knows everything about everything except a book, you know, <laughs> let's say. Well, but, you, yeah. you've, you've corrected that. I'm trying. The, uh, the, again, like Susan's book, your book is very achronological. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder how much thinking you did about that structure. And it's like a mural, as yeah. if you were going back to fill in other parts. Well, there, there even was parts where that's what I had to do with successive drafts. I started it um, as someone deeply, deeply in love with a, a bunch of kind of second-generation postmodern writers including, and one book that had an influence on me fairly early is Infinite Jest because it's layered and, 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 and has all these different um, planes. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And it took me years, years before I figured out. By then, it was too late to turn back. Or it was, by the time I figured out, I had no idea what I was doing. I was Richard... Richard Price's nightmare, you know, the, the guy who's at 30, 33, 35, and everything's passing him by, and it ain't happening. Well, that's me. Did and, you actually wait on tables by any chance? You know, and I waited tables once in the village for, two, for a day, and they didn't have me come back, and I knew I wasn't a waiter. <laughs> right. But I, you know, my litany of, of ass-eating jobs is long and is, is, you know, I can hang with, with most people at that. You know, I can do pretty well for myself. Either I put it in a drawer and then I have nothing and I really am, you know, and I really am this guy or I figured it out. And for me, I, I, I through some a la the writing gods, you know, I, I was able to see it through to the end. The, the, the nut of this story, just to get back to the story for a second, yeah. is Newell's disappearance and everything sort of revolves around right. that. Phone right. calls, missed. Um, uh, intersections of lives right. and so on. Why runaways? Why is that such an important subject to you? Oh, geez. Um, that is such a good question. I am someone who is, you know, it, how easily I could have been Newell, how, e how many people I know who in one way or another had their life really go off track in some way or another. Um, I was so unhappy as a teenager. Um, it took years and years to recover from that. Uh, it would, it's no big deal to imagine the difference between, for me anyways, from not wanting to be in my body to that leap of, well, what if someone just isn't there? What if they take off? And then let alone once, and I'm sure Richard could speak to this very well, once you start to do the research and once you get a taste and once you start to learn about these lives and once you talk to people, the responsibility of getting it right of, of kind of flying the flag of, of the, the people who are ignored or lost. Um, for me, Runaways is a huge thing because it also is the promise of someone who is trying to figure out who the hell they are, who is self-centered with no center, which is just such a great phrase. And then to extend that to a 20-year-old woman getting involved with adult films, to extend it to all these directions, it just seems, you know, that's that responds to me in a way that... Um, Another book, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I couldn't do that. This, this got me up in the day and made me actually want to bang my head against the wall. Yeah. That woman, the woman you just mentioned, I think her name or nom de yeah. strip is yeah. Cherry Blossom. Cherry. She wouldn't understand the French pronunciation. <laughs> I didn't she, know she would do Cherry Blossom. Cherry Blossom. Yeah. She, yeah. Draws a, she draws a line. She draws a line at the end. Yeah, she does. That seems to me really important in this book. There's so a scene in which to. she's... She has to. Yeah. Yeah, if, if not, then, you have, then there's just a moral, there's a, a vacuum that I, I, don't, I didn't want to be an author who made, th created that vacuum. I thought it was at yeah. the heart of the book, actually. Yeah, it that has decision. to be. And it reminds me of almost all the, some of the themes in, in all four books um, in that I was sort of talking to Richard about making the decision to shoot. How, how conscious are you guys when you, you're with a character who has to do either this or that? 
do you go through, what kind of thoughts do you go through in trying to render decisions on their behalf? Yeah, I want to hear them answer this because, yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> I, I just feel everything you write is autobiography. So, you, you know, because every time a character hits a crossroads, uh, what they do is informed by your whole life leading up to this moment, making the pen go this way or that way. Um, I, but, I, I mean, I think I work backwards from, from the result, lead, and then I try to lead up to this. I s start with the end, you know. That's, that's fascinating, actually. You, you, the, you know what's going to happen, but then you kind of figure out why. Or how to get there. Yeah. How to get there. Does that question make any sense to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I usually work that way. I usually sort of have this sense of what the character is going to do, and then I start trying to figure out what the path was, um, you know, what the, what the circumstances were and, and what motivated them. But with this book, interestingly, it was the, despite your feeling that the chronology is intricate, um, this book was the most straightforward book I've ever written in terms of my experience of it because I, I just wrote it forward from page one to page whatever, 401. And, um, you know, it was interesting because once I got to the end, I realized that the thing that my character had done wasn't the thing that I'd been leading up to and I actually radically mm. changed the ending. All of these plots are somewhat complex. I'm wondering what, what you do to maintain the clarity. Well, I, I don't outline the book to begin with, but I end up creating such an ornate structure that I don't know where I am, so I try to map it out and then try to figure out where I'm going to go and invariably I lose that outline and make another one that's slightly different and I kind of, you know, fuddle my way along. Uh, but I, they are necessary sometimes when you have a lot of characters and you're, you're moving around the plot pretty tightly. Oh, yeah, I have files and files of, out, of different outlines for the chapters, for the overall yeah. book and as I'm working on different things they change and they evolve and you know, and I have note lists for what I want to achieve in a scene, and, and then I put details in, in that scene so that I, by the, hopefully by the time I get to it, uh, I'll, I'll start to have a sense. And then, of course, I'll, halfway through, I'll realize this scene is done, and I'll take the rest of the notes and I'll throw them somewhere else. But uh, that's probably the, the most... I have a lot of fun with that, trying to figure that out, much more so than I do, let's say, trying to write a halfway decent sentence. Yeah. I, I've, I've made outlines for my outlines. <laughs> you know, I feel like the guy, when I was a kid on the Ed Sullivan show, had eight plates like this. And yeah. Yale Doctor once said, um, researching isn't writing, outlining isn't writing, talking about it isn't writing, writing is writing. And I think, for me, I'm a, an obsessive outliner and then a mini outliner and then a, you know, subdural outliner. <laughs> and and it's, all, it's all about, like, not wanting to write right. a lot. Yeah. Going back to decisions for, mm. for a second, you, are you aware of, of, I mean, did you consciously think, for instance, in Cherry Blossom and in Lorraine's decision and about letting Kenny, uh, Newell, uh, Newell go out, I'm just curious about the way novelists think That's about their crucial decisions for their characters. It was a, I thought it, one idea I do have a lot is what's a better story? What's more interesting? It's more interesting to have this be, let's say, a couple who are doing well, who at a dinner party are, would be the couple that everyone wants to, uh, that everyone you think their life is, is wonderful, and have them be decent, good, smart people doing the best they can and have the kid disappear than, say, to have it be a toothless trailer park, although you could certainly make a great drama about that. But it's, it, it's a better story. It's a better story if, um, if she's had to be talked into something that she and her worst fear actually does come true. That's good. That's pretty good. Uh, I had a good... I ha there were some very, very smart people who thought that Cherry should do the scene. Who thought that you know it's a better it's a better deal, and I I couldn't I couldn't you know I knew that for her it has to leave off at that moment where she pulls well, I don't want to say it but there's a moment at the end where she displays amazing generosity and decency and almost a gift to someone else uh, in a moment kind of saving him for a second, and I knew that's her you know that's her end and that end doesn't occur. 
without her making a certain other decision. Um, and, and so yeah, I think you do, you do kind of know the big moments that define a character, you have to know what they're gonna, what that means for them, yeah, I think so. Ray has suffered an enormous trauma that has to do with a global event. Yes. It, he decides to go away. Right. Does he decide to go away, or is it necessary? Um, well, he, he goes away. He, he becomes a, uh, I guess, a foreign aid worker. Uh, he, he goes to um, places where uh, there's been a war, a natural disaster, and he just rescues people and saves them and goes on to the next one and is uh, somehow <clears throat> traumatized uh, by that. Uh, I, um, I was thinking as you were uh, discussing this about him, actually, I have a scene in which um, uh, he's in a, a uh, closet. Uh, he's blundered into the house where the bad guy is um, about to kill another bad guy. And uh, he and Ray is is both brave but cautious. And uh, the the uh, the bad guy um, is uh, Ray is in this closet where there's all these these golf balls and shoes and stuff. And he's and he knows that the uh, the the one bad guy is killing the other bad guy with a golf club, and he can hear it. And uh, I struggled with whether or not Ray was going to come out and try to stop this killing or the reader, not. The reader struggles with it, too. It's and, a wonderful scene. And uh, because he would have the element of surprise, but the guy has a golf club, and, there's, and it's been revealed that there's a gun in a drawer, and the bad guy has the gun. And uh, he's, he, Is he a coward in that moment? I'm not sure, uh, but he's, he's self-preserving, he's self and he stays in, in this uh, closet listening to this wet smashing sound of uh, one bad guy killing another bad guy with a golf club. And uh, I think that as a novelist, you, you kind of put yourself in the, in the place of these characters and kind of act out the, the role and sort of grimace privately to yourself and sort of, I don't know if you do this, but I kind of lurch around while I'm writing and, and then... Uh, and think it through. Do you turn into a 75-year-old fail? You, listen, you're a writer. Why is it a math department? Why isn't it an English department? I meant to ask you before. Why is it a math department? Yeah. Well, I mean, leaving aside the sort of real-life basis of the story, the Unabomber, I mean, what, what serial bomber is going to target people in an English department? It's like, <laughs> since when did the society I don't know, society to the like contrary. <laughs> it's a lot of envy in English departments, I'll tell you. It's almost as much. Uh, this this matter of decision making and putting yourself in characters' places is fascinating to me. Do you all experience? Have you experienced this phenomenon that novelists talk about of characters telling you what to do, sort of speaking back to you? I I, I think there's a line. There's a the, there. You think about a character, and you get to a certain point of feeling like you know the character. But once you commit ink to paper, and you start putting on the clothes of the character. You really get to know this character. And then certain things that you thought hypothetically the character should do don't make any sense anymore. Or it makes more sense um, given this zig that he's definitely got a zag right here. And I wouldn't have known it. I think, I, I think the physical commitment of writing um, takes you to a place of knowing your character that you couldn't have anticipated before. Some, some people say that halfway through a book, the second half is written. With, I mean, of course you have to write it, which is a huge pain, but well, I had that it requires something coming up. I had an interesting experience in that I had a couple of minor characters really want to take over the book. And in fact, in drafts right up until final you know the last year of writing they did you know because they they were great they're charismatic and they're funny as hell and and what's happening to them is really dramatic and they were like we can take this book this, this is ours you know to hell with this and and i, I just had to ch make dramatic changes i do think um especially 
when you put a lot of balls in the air and have a lot of plates going, there is something to ha making sure that that second half just drives, that it's, that a person reading it, you know, that it's a challenge to them to put it down and that that momentum hopefully just becomes a consummate force that helps you, helps you get through it. So there's a greater, or greater need to build that tension for the second half. It's like groundwork and the, all four of I these books do exactly that, I, by I, the way. I don't know, greater, I don't know. I know that, you know, a big book, that second half, to get to the end, you, you know, I would say, and I, Susan and I once talked about this, that in our generation, the first half of a lot of books is really, really good, but a lot of people have problems f bringing it home. And that was something that I know that I was, I was conscious of. I don't know how successful I was or wasn't, but I was aware of how many books where you read and there's that 150 pages of, oh dear God, is <laughs> it really all this good? And then it settles down and you find out what the book really is or isn't. And that that was something um, that I, you know, I was aware of. And I think maybe there's some practical and, and pragmatic reasons why those 150 pages are so often so good, you know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why that is. I mean, so, yeah, we did talk about that once because so many books start strong and then they just can't finish. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and I, I almost wonder if it's like writing habits because I think young writers tend to obsessively revise and revise and revise. You know, you, you write your first 50 pages and then you love them and you keep working on them. And then, you know, by the time you're finishing your book, you're there's a certain, like, yeah, there's <laughs> battle fatigue. You, yeah. just, you just start giving things up. As so you I, go on, you learn tricks, of course, too. Tell me. <laughs> I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can bring in a new character who hasn't appeared yet. That's, you know, one way to keep throwing fuel on the fire. But I interrupted you, Richard. You. No. Um, I, f for me, I just have the opposite thing. I, I, I feel like the hardest thing, the hardest part of the book to write is the first sentence. And I feel like there's a certain self-consciousness mm -hmm. in the beginning you know, it's like you, you're on a motorcycle and you just keep jumping up and down yeah. until it catches. And that's the yeah. first part of the book for me. But what, well, once I'm rolling, I just feel like everything just, yeah, I wish everything would fall in place. But, I mean, it's, as, as it starts building momentum, I, I get more sure-footed and less self-conscious. I feel like in the beginning, it's like, okay, how do you do this again? Yeah. How do you do this again? Wait a minute. You know, it's like, okay, uh you, you know, and I've never lost that. It's like eight books. I've never lost that. Like, how do you, how do you start this? Do you feel, to ask a question, do you feel that each time you write a novel, you have to teach yourself how to write a novel all yeah, over I again? Yeah, think, I think you never learn how to write a novel because every mm -hmm. story has its own way of being right. told. Right. And what worked before um, is not necessarily going to work again. Not only that, but I feel like there's, there's no book that's more fun than the first book because when you write that first book, you're a writer. After that, you're a goddamn author, <laughs> you know, and you become in competition with yourself. You right. can, all you think is, oh my God, People Magazine, you know, gave this three and a half stars, and, and you also, I, I get selective amnesia. All I can remember is the book in the bookstore and the book party, yeah. but I can't remember like pulling my hair out for three and a half years to get the book in the bookstore. It's like it never happened. And this is the first time it's ever been hard, you know, and I just can't. Well, that's partly maybe because you, as you said before, you have five years between novels, so it one, yeah. that's one reinvention right there. By the way, the word novel means new. So it does, each one is new almost by definition. Oh, good. <laughs> well, so between glad. novels, you know, writers make little journeys, and whether it's one year, two years, five years, um, you know, your style can change a little bit. Uh, there's what you're interested in, there's what's coming to you, there's uh, what, uh, what you know about how to put a story together, they're the curiosities that you accrue, and so that when you come up to the point where you're going to write a new book, uh, you're not exactly the same person you were before last time, and so why would, why would the process be uh, recognizable? You have to kind of start anew. Speaking of um uh, new things coming to you, accruing to you. The, the, the theme here really is about the geographical spread of these books and, and maybe all modern novels. Are you aware or have you become more aware in the last few years of the whole world as you write? Uh, Charles, this is your first novel, so it may not be. And let, her, let Susan apply to you. Yeah. Yes, Go. <laughs> definitely. 
Definitely, yeah. I mean, I don't know what you mean by more aware of the whole world, but more, I felt more dependent on the whole world or more, um, I don't know, somehow I, I, the whole world is the context for everything, I guess, if that's, if that's what you're asking about. It is, in general terms. Does, it, does the question make any more specific sense to anyone else? I mean, have you uh, changed? Well, I, your... I, think it, I think it goes back to something you said earlier. Are you aware of, like, greater powers, you know, you know uh, putting pressure on small, small people? And I think that that has come into my work, whereas I, I keep trying to keep having tunnel vision just writing about the little, you know, pockets of hell that I usually write about, but it's all these, you know, a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere and a tidal wave on, on, on Ludlow Street. Like a Chinese businessman. Well, that. absolutely. I mean, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, aware of the, the world, and I think that, that uh, you know, I always mutter everything's connected to everything. And, uh, you know, in this book... We have some rogue Chinese investors who are, are uh, actually end up affecting uh, these uh, young, um, uh, illegal Mexican women who have come to New York City to make some money. And, and uh, so you have these, these connections across great distances. And I think that writers are aware of uh, the increasing connectivity of everything and not only is there, uh, are there story-making opportunities in that, but also almost a necessity to articulate uh, the dynamic so that we can all kind of understand it uh, for ourselves. Do you think 9-11 had a huge impact on oh, fiction? Oh, it changed everything. In fiction in this way? <laughs> what in this happened way? on 9-11? <laughs> no, I'm just, I mean, without going to the cliched aspects of 9-11, it seemed to me that there was a shift in fiction afterward, and it became almost, really, uh, over the course of two or three years, not just about 9-11, but also more global and just more aware. I don't know if there's been a shift. I mean, I, I definitely think that, like, I definitely think that most writers already publishing went into a period of deep and sort of damaging self-consciousness after 9-11. I'm not sure if it's a shift so much as a bunch of people going, like, what can I write about, and is it okay? You know, is, is my subject worthy enough? I don't know if we've produced a shift. I think we've produced a lot of neurotic think, worrying about whether what we write about is, like, And important. I think something else was happening already. Um, maybe it's because Internet researching made interconnectivity a lot easier. Maybe it's because things were already underway. Maybe it's because we, there started to be booms where the New Yorker is doing its fiction from India issue. But there were a lot of things where the world, was, the world of fiction was opening up where we were seeing huge amounts of research on page where a certain amount of writers were already kind of connecting dots. Uh, uh, where Zadie Smith had that line where she even said, I believe it was about there's no more characters, there's only how systems move and relate to one another. This was all kind of, I think there were things already uh, uh, happening. It's interesting because I find myself um, very interested in the lives of, of let's say, the deli, the, de the person at, at the Korean deli. And I wonder if there's going to be a burnout in terms of the story of how that person got there and how it's all interconnected. Because at a certain point, there's going to be, there's a gen going to be a general acceptance that it, things are things are connected right. in some ways and there's only so many times you can read that yeah. trail. I wonder, that's something I wonder about. But I don't know the that, answer. I mean, did she really say there's no more characters because you know, at the same time that. you're interested in the deli owner. I mean, I feel as if there's, I feel as if there's sort of a greater emotional yeah, intensity I don't agree or like with higher emotional line, stakes. But, like. yeah, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I noticed right after 9-11 is that I think most, most of the people in the arts uh, went through it, it, almost like a knee-jerk feeling of like self-loathing. That they feel like, how am I going to, I'm doing my abstract art. What does this have to do with anything? Yeah. And then I think a lot of them came through that and they realized because life goes on. I thank you so much for coming. This has been absolutely fascinating. And um, it, it occurs to me that we've talked a lot about research and drafts and so on. So I thought what I would do today is um, give you a book that uh, is also the product of research but it is a wonderful book if you want to get around writer's block. It's a book called uh, A la carte, and it's by a woman, Hilary Carlip, who collected 
shopping lists that she found discarded and then made up characters for them. So her research was minimal. And I want you to look at this with envy and her writing process also very short and simple. Unlike Las Vegas, we hope very much that what goes on in title page will be spread far and wide, all over the map. Thanks for stopping by. Keep reading. Welcome to Paradise. Welcome to Paradise.